Hello, Cardinal Nation. Steve Crawford, Executive Director of Alumni Relations. Welcome back to the special two-part episode of Inside the Nest, your behind-the-scenes tour of all things Otterbein. In our first part, Stephen Grinch, University Archivist and Otterbein alumnus, gave us insights into both the naming and building of Towers Hall. In part two, Stephen takes us inside the majestic Towers Hall. Enjoy this episode. The one thing that every Otterbein student has had in common since 1871 is that they have lived, worked, and taken classes in Towers Hall. A lot of students walk by these portals and think, wow, there must have been windows down here. But in reality, these are the old coal chutes. Back when this building was heated with coal burning furnaces in every classroom, what we had to do was have coal delivered to the basement here in Towers. And then inside of here were basically large dumb waiters where coal would be shuttled into the elevators and taken up to the top of the building and disseminated. I am told, once again, referring to Dr. Hancock and his work in Otterbein history, that one of the pranks in the chapel was to take all of the pews out of that space and toss them down these coal chutes. Apparently, if we could open this back up and look inside, we might still see some of the broken shards of the pews that got thrown all the way to the bottom. This is what the basement looked like when the building was built. The building's basement remained unfinished well into the 1950s. It wasn't until business manager Sanders Fry came in and made this his office that really a floor was laid and the walls were added to this basement area. Under uh, Red Moreland, this became the mail room and eventually the copy center, which it still is today. But it's wonderful that there are still remnants of the old structures to be seen here behind closed doors in the mail room. Under Sanders Fry, this area of the basement became known as the Sinner's Sanctum. Now, that's not to say that they were doing anything horrible down here, but in the 1950s, smoking had been banned on campus. A lot of times you would see the students walk literally to the edge of campus on College Avenue and just step one foot off to smoke. The faculty needed a place too, so uh, Sanders Fry always had the coffee pot running down here. Students like David Deaver, former Otterbein professor, was one of the students in charge of making sure the percolator went to full steam. And so between classes, faculty would sneak down here and they would smoke. A lot of times, faculty would come down here even if they didn't smoke, because this became known as the best place to hang out, hear the college gossip, and just to hang out and chill with the rest of the faculty. There's a lot of history on the first floor of Towers Hall. Starting back behind me on the south corner of the building, you have what used to be Dr. McFadden's Science Lecture Hall and Cabinet. The lecture hall was on the east side of the building, and that's literally what it says on the package. That's where he taught his class. But then across the hall on the other side was the scientific cabinet. We'd probably call it the lab today. All of the 19th century scientific equipment was located there for the students to use. Dr. McFadden, after the Civil War, actually was given permission and money by the university to go to Europe to bring back the best scientific equipment that he possibly could for the edification of the students. What he found in Europe was that everything was overpriced and that almost all of it he could recreate here in Westerville with just a little bit of woodworking know-how and some metallurgy. So he came back with the entire bankroll and created all of our scientific apparatus by himself. Other points of interest on the first floor include these beautiful bookcases, one on each side of the building. These mirror the two entrances to the building, and once upon a time, these would have led to entrances into the chapel that lived inside the building. When Otterbein was founded, of course, we were founded by the United Brethren Church, and so daily chapel was required. It wasn't always necessarily a religious service, but it was always some sort of campus meeting where announcements would be made. Um, there would be concerts occasionally, lectures. So it was a very important part of student life for many years, well into the uh, 1960s and even the 70s. 
But when you look at the bookshelves today, you will see the names of prominent donors to our university and to the refurbishing of towers, as well as volumes for all of our past presidents. As we enter the 20th century, Towers Hall was still not Towers Hall, but it was also no longer just the main building, it was known as the Ad Building, short for Administration Building. The reason for that is all of the classroom space on the front of the building had been converted into the administrative offices of the university. Our longest serving president, Walter G. Klippinger, had his office and uh, his secretary's office here in the center. There were meeting rooms down in Dr. McFadden's old classroom. And then as you get further into the 20th century, the alumni will tell you that the student mailboxes were in this hallway. They weren't mailboxes like we have today. These were literally just open cubbies where people would place notices, classwork, whatever you had. There wasn't quite the same need for security in the age before Amazon deliveries. Back behind this wall, prior to 1954, was the chapel. After that, it became the stacks area of the Centennial Library, and today it is our computer science department. Thank you so much, Stephen, for sharing your expertise on the majestic Towers Hall. Now, if you and Cardinal Nation have topics or additional places on campus you would like to see, please email me at crawford2 at otterbein.edu. Thank you so much for watching this special two-part episode of Inside the Nest. Until next time, Cardinal Nation, thanks for watching. <laughs>